STV, votre télé. Integration, integration, and integration. These words were sounded uh, so many times in Jamena last week when leaders of the Central African Economic and, Economic and Monetary Community, CEMAC, met in the Chadian capital to map the way forward for sub-regional integration. Uh, it should be noted that countries of the sub-region are facing shocks, shocks which have made their economies uh, very, very weak. But uh, at the end of the October 31 uh, crucial meeting, measures were taken to ensure that the free movements of goods and persons become uh, a reality. But how far-reaching were some of these measures and how attainable will they be? That is our focus tonight, and my guest is a high-level official from the Presidency of the Republic and an international economic and development consultant. He will be taking us uh, through this issue. This is Hard Talk. Just as I told you earlier, my guest is a senior international economic and development consultant. He works at the presidency of the Republic. In fact, he is the technical advisor at the, at the presidency of the Republic. He is no other than Mr. Christian Penda Ekuka. Christian Penda Ekuka, welcome to her talk. Thank you, Peter. Now, um, leaders of the Semak sub-region uh, met in Jamena to uh, chart the way forward for uh, sub-regional integration. Uh, we know that uh, before this meeting, uh, the, most of the countries in the sub-region had decided to scrap all visa procedures mm -hmm. for nationals of the bloc uh, within 90 days. Now, from uh, your perspective, will it be safe to say that uh, it was more of uh, some hidden factors rather than the will to integrate that forced them uh, to come together? Peter, at least we should, uh, we should think that they did it this time out of good faith and foresight. If this is the case, uh, we should appreciate it as uh, a, a good change of mind because uh, uh, actually as a positive decision. Because you know uh, the revenues of many of those uh, economies are highly dependent on uh, the export of oil. So it made those economy very fragile and vulnerable to the vagaries of oil prices. Uh, for instance, the revenues of countries like Gabon, Chad, and Congo, and EG, Equatorial Guinea, depend on oil for more than 90%. Uh, the same figure for Cameroon is about 25%. So you can see that the economy of Cameroon is much more diversified than the economy of those countries. Yeah. So what's happened is that when the prices of oil is high, they tend to isolate themselves from the rest of the of the of, 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 of the of the sub region. When the when the prices of oil, you know, when 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 the when it's sunny, when it's sunny for them, because yeah. the prices of the economy they sell very you well. Know, it sell, it sell yeah. very well. They tend to sell by their own. But this time, as you know, the prices of oil has slumped, has plummeted uh, significantly. And I think this made them to understand and to see the beauty of the subregional integration. Actually, to see it as an opportunity and not as a threat. So that's why I'm saying that if, uh, by the force of the circumstances, they are now see, they are now seeing the beauty of subregional integrations as opportunities, as opportunities for. Uh, growth, inclusive growth, as opportunity for job creation, then is a positive move. We're talking of a sub-region of about 51 million people. Of course, for me, this is CIMAC. But don't forget that uh, 
we, we should talk tomorrow. For me, this is a transition. This is a, a transition to region. This is a transition move towards what I call ICAS. ICAS is the economic community of Central African states. Uh, so including uh, DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, including Angola, including Burundi, Rwanda, and so on and so forth. And when you're talking about ECAS, which is the equivalent of ECOWAS in the western side of, the, of, of Africa, yeah. when you're talking about ECOWAS, we're talking about almost 200 million people. You know, sure. and this is the bigger, and this is the bigger subregion. This is a bigger regional, you know, uh, setting. And this setting of uh, ECAS was actually designed uh, within uh, the the action plan of Lagos in 1980. You know, so uh, we we should not be blind about this uh, CMAC. That for me, 50 million people, you know, we can uh, is a transition towards a bigger subregion, a bigger regional uh, market. Look which is uh, the, the, the acres, economic, uh, uh, economic community of Central African states, which is almost 200 million people. And, and then Cameroon has a kind of strategic position within the Gulf of Guinea, because not only we have that acres of about 200 million consumers, 200 million markets, you know, but also uh, because of our Western neighbor, uh, which is Nigeria, which is almost 186 million people. So Cameroon can really design its economy to be within this uh, market of 400 million people. You know, it, it just depends on the vision of, of, of the people. And that's why when coming back, uh, coming back to, the, to your question about uh, the, um, uh, the leaders uh, and, and, and the move they have just done, this was a long overdue decision. This was a long overdue decision. I have been working on this regional integration for more than 25 years. And they have been talking about this uh, uh, free movement of people, goods and services for more than 25 years. And why it didn't come true? Why it didn't happen? Well, perhaps let me ask you the question because I was just connecting to, uh, uh, I would just like to take it from there. Um, we know that it has been a long time. So mm -hmm. um, why waste all, well, what is the reason behind the delay? But the reason, the reason behind the delay is, is always the same, is... Uh, lack of political vision. Uh, you, we need leaders of uh, really great audacity, uh, great uh, vision to understand that it's better to join forces, uh, that it's better to have uh, this, uh, you know, a bigger market, uh, a market integra an integrated market, instead of uh, isolating them, uh, ourselves within national boundaries with small market like uh, one, 1 1.5 million, 2 million here, you know. Uh, even the, 20, the 23 million of Cameroon is not that much. When you can build a kind of bilateral integration with Nigeria, you know, this gives you immediately an opportunity to sell to 200 million consumers. When you can integrate uh, DRC within this market, you're talking about 80 million 80 people, million. you know. And uh, as you see, th this regular setting is always you know, opportunities for the younger people. And we should always see it from the younger people perspective. The youth is our main challenge today. How are we going to generate hope for those young people? You know, in terms of jobs, in terms of employment, in terms of the beauty of their life tomorrow. It's only through, uh, you know, uh, boosting the economy, they're making a, a kind of inclusive economic growth. It's only through this kind of process and strategy that we are going to create opportunities for many of those young people. And they are, and they are the major challenges for us for tomorrow. So, I, I mean, to, to come back to your question, it's only a lack of vision, a lack of political will, a lack of political audacity that can prevent the people to understand actually the benefits of having an integrated market. All right. Now, when, when we look at the sub-region, we find that the economic, the industrial tissue is a bit weak. And we find that most of the goods that uh, are being circulated in the region are just uh, basic goods. That's goods that are... Uh, just come fresh from the farms and farms to, to the market. Now, do, do, do we have uh, the much needed industrial tissue to have a common market within the sub-region? Will it be an issue of just selling tomatoes from the south region of Cameroon, maybe to Gabon, or maybe moving Aero from the south region into Equatorial Guinea? Yeah, of course, no. Uh, I mean, you need to, you need to, to do what we call uh, climb 
the value chain. That means going through the uh, industrial processing of these raw materials, basic commodities, and even uh, mining and oil and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the beauty of the regional integration is that it gives you uh, a bigger market, and then uh, you can get the benefit of the economy of scale. You know, when you're building a manufacturing unit, you are always talking about size. Uh, I mean, the, the, the small uh, manufacturing units, we're talking about a million of goods per, 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 uh, per month or the million of goods per, per, I don't know, per day and so on and so forth. Uh, if, if you go for uh, three shifts, if you go for two shifts two or shifts. you go for one shift. So meaning that it's only through uh, uh, a, 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 an integrated market that you can have the benefit of attracting foreign investors and even local investors and even private operators to create, you know, a, a, a bigger unit uh, uh, taking advantage of the economy of scale. When you, you have kind of scattered kind of scattered economy, small economy, isolated economy as what we have uh, uh, before, you, you cannot attract investors to, to build industries. You cannot attract investors to build manufacturing setting. That's what I was telling you about integrated, actually, the Central African market, not only with the CIMAC, but within the acres, and also having Nigeria inside it. Of course, I know Nigeria is part of ECOWAS, mm -hmm. but be, because of our strategic position, we talk about geography, because of our yep. strategic position, you know, we have no problem. I don't see why Cameroon is going to build uh, uh, you know, a partnership, partnership with, with some with, uh, with your uh, European <laughs> countries and it cannot build it with... Uh, in Nigeria, when uh, we have uh, uh, 200 million that. people sitting just next door, yeah. and you have the possibility of selling them uh, yam, cocos, and uh, all this stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if we have a kind of bilateral, bilateral trade and investment agreement with Nigeria, you will see the, the immediate impact of it right away, and have a clearing house, meaning that you know, an importer, uh, an import, a Cameroonian importer can import from Nigeria, uh, from a Nigerian exporter's good, and this Nigeria and this Cam Cameroonian importer can write a check in CFA yeah. to the Nigerian guy and Nigerian exporter, and this Nigerian exporter will go to the clearing house. To cash his money in Naira, you know, but we don't have this kind of setting. By having this kind of setting, clearing house, it will make it easy for uh, the trade not to go in a formal way with all the risk of losing, uh, in, you know, money, currency, and so on and so forth. But both. Says Nigeria and Cameroon will benefit from that. So since there will have some, there will be some taxes on this transaction. Now, uh, there has been so much debate about the currency of the sub region, about the francs CFA itself. We, we, we hear of the West African bloc of the foreign CFA trying to institute a common currency and we, we are also aware that within the CEMAC sub-region uh, the uh, fixed reserve is very low and, and we all know that uh, the uh, monetary policy as well is limited. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that play into the sub-regional drive? Uh, Peter, listen, you know, uh, l l I, it's not that I don't want to make it an obsession. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say is normal that a country should, rec should recover, you know, a kind of sovereignty uh, control over its monetary policy, over its currency, which is, which is normal. And I think we will reach uh, that goal. Because after all, if you see the trends of the international trade, you can see how many of the Central African states have diversified 
you know, the, 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 the trade partners. Uh, you know, China is playing uh, a major role now in this trade, and some Japan and some other Asian countries, Brazil, India, and so on and so forth. So, uh, in, in the short term, I think we will recover this uh, monetary uh, sovereignty. But having said that, I don't make it an obsession. Why? You, you have many countries in Africa that have their own currency. Yeah. It did not make them better off. It did not make them better off. As you know, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, has its own currency for a long time. You know, uh, Zimbabwe has its own currency for so many years. Ghana, in the past, before structural adjustment of Ghana, before the 1980s, has its own currency, you know. And this does not, and this did not make the economy performant. I'm not saying that we should not recover. As you say, I say that we should recover. Yeah. But having said that, we should recall that there are so some major challenges in terms of uh, financial, public financial management of the places. If those challenges in terms of budgetary policy, discipline in managing our budget, discipline in managing uh, the allocation of resources, because oftentimes resources are allocated based on some uh, political criteria instead of uh, you know, the, this the, the allocation of the various, yeah, uh, being submitted to the forces of market, to the yeah. efficient, economic efficiency. So you can see how people will go and build, you know, tractors in the Bolova, and then you don't see uh, the rationale behind this, uh, you know, decision. You will see someone going to build a uh, uh, slaughterhouse, poultry slaughterhouse, in the places where they don't have live birds to yeah. to, to supply so that to uh, supply. That, that slaughterhouse. You will see a cassava plant being built in a places where you don't have uh, a, a raw cassava. So you know you see a number of decisions that are being made based on some political consideration that actually have a, a very uh, bad uh, uh, impact on our economy and, and life. So that's why I'm saying that if this kind of failures are not corrected first, then if you recover your monetary sovereignty within this kind of failures, within the con this context of failures, you're only going to worsen the, you situation. Know, the situation. This is what I'm saying. You see? So uh, you understand my question. It yeah, means sure. that, you know, uh, certainly for me, uh, the country, many country members of this CFA zone, monetary zone, are in, the t in the term, they are going to recover the sovereignty. But if this sovereignty is not recovered within much more discipline in terms of uh, public financial management, we are just going to aggravate, to aggravate the situation. Okay, um, now... Most of the Semak uh, countries are linked to the IMF uh, due, due to their weak economies. And uh, because of we, we, we all know about Cameroon, that has already struck it due to the IMF. Congo mm -hmm. is also in the process. Uh, can these countries develop uh, a strong economy with uh, these loans that are being uh, gotten from the IMF? Yeah, Peter, history does not teach us of any country that has developed with, you know, uh, or by a third party. If the leaders of the country are not committed to the development of the country and translate this commitment, this political commitment, in very concrete strategies, you know, mobilizing their own people for, you know, uh, a true and genuine development by themselves, kind of indigenous more driven development, the country will not develop. This is what the lesson that we can derive from the experience of the Asian countries, including you know, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Japan itself, and even China now. So uh, loan is good. Loan is good. Loan is not, it's not the principle of uh, borrowing money. It's what you're doing with your money. With the money. If, you, if you're contracting a loan, for a productive investment, that means for investment that is not going to generate wealth, to make you able to reimburse the loan and to save something, you know, uh, then this loan is unproductive. And we can see in the case of, for instance, Cameroon and some other Central African state, 
they have contracted, you know, in productive loans. That means a huge amount of loans that were invested into a productive investment. Uh, and you know them. It can be some, uh, you know, things like uh, tractors uh, somewhere, things like uh, hydroelectrical dams, okay. uh, which are very costly and expensive uh, by the uh, uh, industrial standards. You know? so, you're su so you're suggesting that the governments invest on uh, SMEs? But of course, what, what, exactly, exactly, what, what, exactly. What I'm suggesting is that you cannot build an inclusive economy, grow, vibrant economy, without involving your own people. That means, well, this is what I call an entrepreneurial economy. Yeah. Only entrepreneurs, having local entrepreneurs with multipliers effect. You see, when you build uh, those, uh, these things like uh, the stadiums, you know, you know, those stadiums for, uh, you know, the, the football cup in 2019. 19. And that there is no multiplier effect. The, the, you don't maximize the local content of this investment, meaning that you won't have any kind of subcontractors uh, getting some local SMEs to participate in the construction process. So there is no, so it doesn't trickle down to the benefit of your SMEs. You know, uh, it, it's not now. It's not the loan associated with this uh, stadium that is going to be a problem. The problem will be that you are not building the stadium with the participation of your own uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. And even the cement factory are not going to supply cement. And you have some small, some, some small entrepreneurs, you know, uh, providing, uh, supplying sand and this kind of thing. They are not going to operate. You know, they are not going to take advantage to benefit from this kind of investment. That's the only way a country can develop, by having local entrepreneurs, by having an entrepreneurial economy. A country is not developing by a civil servant, by, you know, a, a huge bureaucratic system that is going to paralyze the whole system. As you know, a country is not going to develop by having, uh, you know, uh, a, a huge uh, system of bureaucracy, or corrupted bureaucracy. And there is no country that are going to develop that. Once we, in, within the region, we will recogn recognize that and acknowledge that only entrepreneurs can develop a country uh, that we will give the private sector or the private sector will become the main engine of growth. And the government is there to create the physical conditions in terms of uh, roads, uh, port, infrastructure, and so on and so forth, and build uh, incentives tax incentives, some legislative incentives, financial incentives to facilitate, you know, the development and the emerging of uh, local entrepreneurs only under that condition that country will develop, not by having loan from some external party. Yeah. The loan, this external party loan will not develop the, the place, of course. And only free minds, only free people can develop their own country. All right. Um, there was this policy of the regional economy program, which SEMA countries adopted, uh, which spells out a common uh, development agenda, if you can put it that way. Uh, it was uh, the Agenda 2035. Exactly. But we see that uh, SEMAG leaders are talking about creating this common market and boosting their economies when Cameroon has an ambition of uh, 20, 2035. Equatorial again is talking about 2020. Gabon has its own uh, emergence plan. Uh, is that really a disturbing situation? Yeah, of course, it's a disturbing situation, but at the same time, as I told you earlier, where there is a will, there is a way. Where there is no will, there won't be a way. So it all boils down to uh, leadership commitment to really build uh, an integrated economy or a subregional integrated economy or a regional integrated economy. And uh, if really this is a will, there will be a way. If they have that vision, if they have the audacity of this will, then there will be a way, okay? They will empower people, they will empower regional institutions so that they can play the role. Okay, when you're talking about the uh, uh, emerging status, okay, like uh, E.G. Katria Guinea saying that he's going to read the emerging status in 2020, in 2020 or 2025, Cameroon is talking about 2035, so some other country is talking about some other horizon. You know, the, 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 it's not, this is, this should translate in concrete terms. You, you just, you just don't become an emerging economy like that. Yeah. The, the, you have some concrete indicators like GDP, GDP per capita or your revenue per capita. You know, so it means that 
for a country like us to become, let's say, uh, an emerging economy by uh, 2035, 2035 okay. well, you, will have, you will need to have a GDP of almost 10000 10, to $12,000 per, per capita per head. Yeah. But today, what you have is uh, $1,200 per, US dollars per capita. So you can see what it will take you as in terms of uh, pace of growth to reach that point. You will need to achieve on a sustained and sustainable level for the next 20 years, you will need to achieve a rate of growth of about 10% per year on a sustainable level, 8 to 10% per year. Today, you are toiling, Cameroon is toiling to achieve 5% or 4%. So you understand? So this is one of the, one of the indicators that can tell you that are we going to achieve that goal? I think uh, uh, not necessarily uh, at the pace that we are, our economy is growing now. The other thing is that you have some other indicators like uh, the level of literacy, the level of literacy, uh, the... Uh, the um, you know infantile mortality, the maternal mortality; those are social indicators, and the number of uh, doctors per uh, inhabitants, per patients, uh, per patients or uh, even per, uh, per inhabitant. You have some word uh, WHO have some yeah. own indicators about that. So you need to have these kind of indicators. You need to reach the indicators about the, uh, the, the the on the academia, the number of. Uh, uh, student per classroom, the number of students per teach per teachers, and so on and so forth. Those are clear indicators. You know the uh, accessibility of uh, the population to basic infrastructures like uh, you know potable water, electricity, electricity good housing, roads. good roads, transportations, uh, sanitations, and things like that. Those are basic indicators where it can qualify you or make you eligible to the status of an emerging country. It's not, by, it's not an oracle. It's not an oracle. It's not like an oracle that, you know, incantation that you, uh, I will be uh, 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 an emerging country by 2020, and when 2020 arrives, it will be like, uh, you know, an act of God. It will so, not be an act of God. So, so now there's a need for these countries to harmonize their development plans. Do you share that? Yes, of course. They need to uh, have a kind of, kind of uh, harmonization, uh, even to give the signal to some external investors, because an external investors cannot, you know, foreign investors cannot, even even local investors, they they cannot come to the sub region and have a kind of double standards or even triple 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 standards. You go to Gabon, you have a kind of uh, tax law. Uh, you come to Cameroon, you have another tax law. You go to Central African Republic, you have another tax law. They will need to harmonize this kind of thing. They will need, they will need to harmonize the, the customs law. They will need to harmonize, uh, uh, you know, the uh, financial accessibility of the thing. You know, uh, the rate of population uh, that have access to financial services is only is less than 10%. Yeah. You know, and this is tremendous. You, you will not reach... Uh, the state of an emerging country by having less than 10% of your population that can access to financial services. And at the same time, how are you going to build a critical mass of SMEs if they cannot access, you know, to the financial services, including loans and some other services, you know? And uh, we need to have some kind of uh, 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 strong institutional, you know, institution uh, a regional institution, I want to say, that will serve the purpose of SMEs in terms of financing, like the Central African State Development Bank. Uh, we need to strengthen those kind of institutions. We need to strengthen some institutions uh, in terms of training the people uh, uh, for the, uh, for an as entrepreneurs. We also need not to forget uh, a whole half of our population, that means women. Yeah. You know, women, we need to empower women. They are, they are clearly a strong part of this deal. And, and we need to make this integration, regional or sub-regional integration, not a top-down process, not a process of bureaucracies. We need to make it a bottom process. Bottom that means a bottom-up approach. That means we need to involve, you know, much more people from the grassroots and get them to understand the beauty of that process. Actually, this process is made for them, and it should be made with them. If you exclude them from uh, the process, the process will fail. You understand? And to that extent, the media has a strong role to play with, you know, within that context. I'm, I'm insisting on that. I'm putting emphasis on this question of the media and the role of the media to help people to raise 
the uh, to raise the consciousness of people, to raise the awareness of people about the common interest, you know, in this uh, subregional integration. Yeah. It has to be a bottom-up process. By building a bottom-up process, by people, uh, by building a process from the grassroots, a democratic process, they will put pressure on the leaders. And don't forget that this was the biggest threat in Europe when you can see things like Brexit, you know, oh. because the British people got the impression that this process in Brussels was a bureaucratic process and was not meant for them, for the, the, the population. And this is also uh, the, the one of the major explanations of the rising of this populism, political populism in many of those uh, European countries, because they all have the impression that a bunch of bureaucracies, a bunch of bureaucrats are making decisions uh, you know, at the, expense, at the expense of yeah. their own interests. So okay. you see, is this, yeah. is, this is very important. All right. Now, uh, moments ago, we were talking about the economic partnership agreement. We know that Cameroon is the only country in the CEMAC bloc to have signed that, that agreement. Now, how does that agreement play within the context of the larger common markets? Do we see other countries, you know, following the steps of Cameroon to sign or do we see them putting pressure on Cameroon to withdraw from the partnership? Uh, it, 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 no, I, I think I think uh, we, you, we should consider uh, Cameroon move as an interim move, as an interim move, because if you want to now uh, build a stronger uh, subregional integration, uh, the move should be. I mean, the negotiation of the economic uh, partnership agreement yeah. should have been carried out within the region, or, or at least negotiated, leveraging. Uh, the regional position okay. to negotiate with Europe. You cannot see scattered countries where each small country is going to negotiate a bilateral agreement with the whole European community. It doesn't make sense for me. You know, uh, each country, Chad is going to negotiate his own uh, bilateral agreement with uh, uh, European, the whole European community. And you can see what the ECOWAS did in the West. The, the, what the ECOWAS did in the West, what the ECOWAS did in the West to, to approach that regional integration uh, from uh, to approach that uh, EPA, the Economic uh, Partnership Agreement, from the regional perspective. Yeah. And I think Cameroon will come to the regional, uh, uh, we come back to that regional perspective. All right. Uh, before we go, I would like to ask you this question uh, away from the issue at hand. Uh, we know uh, Mr. Christian Penda Ekuka as a man who says things the way they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're working at the presidency, a place where uh, things are kept top secret. So uh, what is your driving force? Because we see you react on uh, many issues of national life, politics, economy, society. Where do you have that inspiration for your freedom? Well, you know, I mean, the uh, people are raising always this, uh, this question about me. Uh, first of all, I was, not, I was not born at the presidency. I'm not a civil servant. I'm coming from a liberal practice. I'm coming from, uh, you know, I have my own consulting firm. I was working uh, in, uh, at SNI as a project development, uh, you know, head of project development. I resigned about 25 years ago to create my own consulting firm. You know, I have consulted in more than 25 African countries in the Caribbean. So seven years ago, the head of state decided to call upon me to help him in my situation. And I have a conviction, one conviction for that, that you cannot advise the head of state if you are not free to tell him your advice. Otherwise, what is, your, what is the purpose of you being there? You know, you have to be free. Uh, Peter, one thing I didn't uh, I forgot, I, I didn't forgot, but you don't raise the issue. You know, the uh, uh, kind of information and communication technology, yeah. well, they are going to have a bear on this uh, so process of integration. Absolutely. Because, uh, you know, ICT has become a kind of transformative. They call it the new economy. The new economy. STV, votre télé.